Back in December of 2023, I did a review of several popular overlay VPN solutions. I think they're really great for solving connectivity issues. They have a reduced threat surface or a more narrow way that you build trust, and they're really easy to set up compared to a lot of the traditional VPNs. But Netbird was one that people had a lot of questions about. Matter of fact, the founders of Netbird, having seen them mentioned in that video, reached out to me and I had some good conversations. And yes, they did send me a shirt. They did send me a shirt with a cool logo on the back of it. And I want to have that disclosed up front. This is not sponsored, but shirts were sent uh, prior to this. But this because I told them I was doing a video on it. And I said, hey, can you wear a Netbird shirt in a video? And I said, well, yes. So these opinions are my own. This has not been editorialized by Netbird at all. And as I said, not exactly sponsored, but I guess I did receive a shirt. So now I'm just being honest. Now, as far as how Netbird works, we're going to talk about some of the functional use cases for it, how it works, and the fact that it's open source, which is one of the reasons I'm talking about it without being paid to talk about it. Because uh, I think it's a really cool project I want to raise some awareness for because I love big open source projects like this because it gives us better visibility, better transparency and security for how things are being done. Uh, but don't worry, if you don't want to set this up yourself, they actually have a paid option as well. Now, this is not a tutorial on how to get started with Netbird, my friend Christian Lumpa has a video you'll find linked down below where he gives you step-by-step -step tutorials on how to get it set up, including, of course, the self-hosted version, which just has a prerequisite of having somewhere to host it and a fully qualified domain name and being able to run some Linux scripts. But let's get started in talking about Netbird and why I think it's a cool product. <music> Are you an individual or forward-thinking company looking for expert assistance with network engineering, storage, or virtualization projects? Perhaps you're an internal IT team seeking help to proactively manage, monitor, or secure your systems. We offer comprehensive consulting services tailored to meet your specific project needs. Whether you require fully managed or co-managed IT services, our experienced team is ready to step in and help. We specialize in supporting businesses that need IT administration or IT teams seeking an extra layer of support to enhance their operations. To learn more about any of our services, head over to our website and fill out the Hire Us form at lawrencesystems.com. Let us start crafting the perfect IT solution for you. If you want to show some extra love for our channel, check out our swag store and affiliate links down below that will lead you to discounts and deals for products and services we discuss on this channel. With the ad read out of the way, let's get you back to the content that you really came here for. Connect and secure your IT infrastructure in minutes. And the first thing I'm going to click on here is pricing, because I know people always ask. And they have a try for free right at the top, but they actually have a free tier. So you can have up to 100 machines if you don't want to deal with setting up hosting and setting up this for the self-hosted. We'll talk about that more in a moment, but they do have a free option. They have a Teams option. They have a business option. They also have some interesting integrations for the business options where you can tie this to things like CrowdStrike for your security tool. Uh, they have different SIM providers that they can export data to. So I think this is kind of cool for businesses looking for using this. Now, as I noted in the beginning, I've been testing this out in my lab. I have not done this in production use. So all my opinions are based on all of my lab testing. I have not fully integrated this into any particular customer, but I really have a strong confidence in the company and where they're going because, well, so far it's worked really, really well. Now let's jump over to the self-hosted ones. I know it's what a lot of people are wondering is how does it work for self-hosted? And their quick start guide is actually really great. Their documentation overall, I'm going to say is good, but I think it's neat that you have this nice one-liner kickoff. So you get a Linux server set up somewhere with a static IP and a domain pointed towards it. You put in the domain as part of the configuration, and then you run the one liner and it will install, set up the certificates and get the whole thing running for you. You just have to sit and wait and watch the magic happen. It's actually really nice. They're using Docker for service delivery on the back end. I think that makes this pretty straightforward as far as the, the underlyings on here. But now let's talk a bit more about actually how Netbird works. And understanding how they work doesn't require any reverse engineering. They've taken the time to build good documentation for this project that walks you through how the technologies work, how they're integrated to each other, how the Netbird system works, the components all the way through. So all of this is very well documented, including how they get around things like if you have to do relaying. And what relaying is, is when you're building these networks, the coordination server figures out where all the servers are and tries to get them to talk to each other. But it does have an option that if they can't talk to each other, it does have relaying as an option where it will use the relay service in order to get the data from peer A to peer B. Now, 
the way these networks work and something I want to be very clear with, especially with Nepper, is your peer A and peer B are going to be using WireGuard as a transport protocol for the data. So even though the data will pass through a relay service, whether you're hosting it or they're hosting it, the data transport is encrypted with WireGuard, therefore going to be invisible in terms of being able to sniff those packets or be able to see what data is going through. Even the discussion that each peer has between peer A and peer B with the relay service is also encrypted. So the control plane is encrypted, the actual transport between the peers is encrypted. So yes, all of this is uh, well done in terms of encryption and they're using WireGuard, as I said, which means they didn't try to invent a new protocol and are not being obscure about any of the tools that they're using in between. Now let's talk about use cases. We have a device with NetBird installed at location A and a device with Nepard Assault at location B. It's a pretty simple setup. We've done no modification to the firewall. It doesn't matter what firewall you're using. The system, as long as it can get out to the internet, and this one can get out to the internet, and the coordination server can see both of these, then it's able to, and this yellow dotted line that's moving represents the wire guard transport being able to talk from location A to location B. It does this with some really clever engineering that does not require modification of the firewall either of these locations. So the firewalls are just passive devices and you don't have to have any control or settings on them, but you do have to have agents loaded on each of these devices for this to work. But you're probably thinking, well, this is pretty much any VPN can do this like OpenVPN or WireGuard bar by itself. Yeah, with two agents set up, pretty simple. We get to a more complex environment, and this is where NetBird really shines. Now, for simplicity of graphics here, I only showed three locations, but this can go and get bigger exponentially, and the complexity of managing a normal VPN becomes extremely complex at that scale. But what we have here is NetBird 1, 2, and 3. These are all devices with the agent loaded, but we have also a phone in the mix, which will have the agent running on here. They're all talking to the coordination server, which will coordinate how all these can talk to each other. And it doesn't matter if the IP address has changed, it'll automatically constantly query and reestablish those connections. But what about the devices that happen to live at location C that we can't load an agent on. Well, NetBird 3 has a published route. That means I can say, hey, this group all has access to this published route. That means whatever devices, maybe they're other IoT devices or different things that need to have access via IP with NetBird 3. NetBird 3 acts as an exit for this entire subnet, therefore granting access to all the devices on that subnet. And that's just part of the published routes. But maybe you also want to encapsulate the traffic from NetBird 1 and send it out of the location for NetBird 2, and that's where exit nodes come in. Matter of fact, you can also probably say NetBird 3, let's exit node through there as well. This is another feature by which you can say, pack up all the traffic and ship it out one particular node. It's all built into the NetBird server, whether the coordination server is hosted by you or hosted by them, all these features still exist. Now let's talk about the NetBird interface itself. This is the self-hosted version, and it looks a little different than when I first set it up. As I noted, they've really made a lot of improvements. We can see that my phone here is online. We can see that it sees the region, and if we actually click on it here, it'll show the NetBird IP address, the public IP address. This is my phone carrier because it's on 5G right now the name of the device and the region it sees it in, which is actually accurate, United States Detroit. And if we go over to other peers, we notice that this one here, NetBird 2, here is the public IP address, which you'll notice is a privacy VPN that puts this one in Zurich, Switzerland. I've been putting it through some different double NAT and challenging situations, and it still connects just fine. And this is also when you're on each node where you can do things like add the different groups for the nodes, the all, and then I have Tom, and we can also add this one like to a test group, or we can freeform and type in another one. We have the ability to enable SSH on the server to access the machine via secure shell. That's actually built right in. I think that's a rather clever feature. We have the ability to make this as an exit node, and we can choose what peers we want to share this exit node with so they can become an exit point for the other nodes and we can add special routes or we can add an existing network that we've already defined so we can say new route and type one in and define it it even has the ability here to choose the routing peers when you're setting it up or as i noted you can do these existing routes and something i want to point out when you're doing any of these you'll notice that there's the ability to link right to the documentation so if you're curious about a setting they have it linked right here they've really thought this out really well Going down here to the setup keys, really easy to create a new key or revoke existing keys. Give the keys a name, assign the keys to a group, decide if you want this key to be reusable, maybe by 
six devices when you're setting it up and you want it to expire in four days, if they haven't used this key within four days, well, you want it to just go away. And we can just hit create the key. It's going to give me that key and we can copy it to the clipboard or hit close. Now we can't see the key anymore. And I'm just going to revoke it now in case anyone wants to try to join my network. I want to prove them. And now they won't be able to be approved since I've disabled that key. I was playing around with a few different things here and it's easy enough to just go in and revoke those keys. If you notice on the peers, you can set the expiration for the peers as well. So if you want these to expire, Buyer, you can. I actually left this one purposely at an older version. The little up arrow here just gives you more information about it, even right to the change log and how to download it. Uh, these Linux installs, AptKit Update is able to do it. I purposely just left this one behind to show you the difference. And I did notice that the current version of Android, even though my Android app says it's up to date, is a little bit behind right now. They are aware. I've actually talked to the founders about that. Now let's go over the access control system. We have a default policy here and it says in this group all as a source and in this group all as a destination, we have back and forth all ports, all traffic. And this policy is enabled. We have the name and description and we don't have any posture checks. What posture checks are is we can say, we want this to validate that the client version has to be at least this in order to connect to that resource. Or maybe we want to say only to a specific region, we want that resource to be allowed to connect. So even though it'd be part of the network mesh, this rule has a posture check of these are the operating systems as equal to kernel this version, equal to this version of Windows, Mac, iOS, or Android. I really like that they let you get granular with this and they even have network range and peers, other details that may matter for how you want to apply those policies. Uh, this is just really cool. And by default, of course, they're all off, making it really simple to do. Now, as far as creating a new policy rule, and you can see that you can choose the groups that you want the policy applied to, choose the traffic ports, and by default, it's going to have all in there, but we can just simply type them in. And then we can give it a name or it'll end up looking like allow web ports. Look at the policy, all, all, ADN 443, this policy is enabled. But of course, it's being overridden by this policy. So if we turn this one off, I didn't have to delete it. And now we know this policy is no longer in effect. And the peers can only talk via this policy. So all peers can talk over 80 and 443 to all other peers. And you can get granular. Maybe we want to add another one for port 22 for SSH or whatever services you want to run. Now down here where it's got posture checks, these are just overall posture checks for maybe you want to restrict country and region. So when someone leaves or is in a certain region, they don't get to access the system at all. So this is not applied to the rule. This is more of a global way to apply those posture checks. Now you get on here to network routes, you add the routes within the peers themselves, but this allows you to go back through and see those routes that you added all in one place. This is a nice way to consolidate that information. Maybe you've got it spread across numerous peers and maybe you want to know which ones have exit nodes on them. I've actually put a route and an exit node on both the same one. They also have a metric to get priority for maybe how you want to tier the routing and the advertised networks through there. So once again, it's well thought out and easy enough to follow with documentation links within here, exactly how to set up these network routes. You do have the option to add custom name servers, Google, Cloudflare, Quad9, or your own custom DNS, along with specific domain overrides. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the users, but I do recommend you read through the documentation to make sure you have a good understanding how that works and how service users can be set up to access things like the API. Once again, that's all covered in our documentation. Now, the last thing I want to cover here is the activities. I really happy they have this. I think this is a critical function you really need is a good, clear logging of what happened in the system. One, just so you can kind of see how a system got to its current state. Two, you could look through here and see changes that were made that maybe someone else made because you have more than one user logging in here. Being able to go through and figure out how something got in its condition with logs and having a searchable log with the activity, I think makes your life a whole lot easier. Now, while I did mention earlier Windows, Mac, and Linux, and Android and iPhone, I did not mention BSD. That's in the works. It's not available here in May of 2024, but I am looking forward to them getting on the BSD platform because, well, it'd be cool if they could integrate into BSD-based firewalls like PFSense. That would be really pretty awesome. Hoping to see that somewhere in the future. But as I said, I'm doing this video because, one, it's a big open source project, and people had asked me what I thought about it, especially after I looked at it. And I got to say, it's impressed me. And 
going back and forth to the founders, just having a good conversation with them. Uh, they are really dedicated to open source. So, hey, I just wanted to raise a little awareness and put it on some people's radar that, hey, if you're looking for a fully self-hosted, not just the open source clients, but a fully self-hosted management control plane for a overlay VPN solution, this one's pretty cool. And of the ones I've tested, this one's really, uh, really impressed me quite a bit. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. Like and subscribe to see more content from this channel. Head over to lawrencesystems.com. Check out our newsletter to stay on top of the things we have going on. And I'll see you over in the forums, forums.lawrencesystems.com. Great place to have a more engaging conversation about this and other topics you've seen on the channel. Thanks.